next talk uh, by this session, uh, we are very excited to have Patrick Perez here. So Patrick is the head of the research at Valeo, uh, it's, which is called Valeo, uh, Valeo AI. Valeo, as you probably know, is one of the global automotive uh, companies. And, uh, and Patrick and his team have been doing very exciting work on making autonomous driving uh, possible, which he'll tell you about. Just to give, tell you a little bit more about Patrick, I know him for a long time. So before he did some very exciting work at uh, Technical and Microsoft, and he was uh, uh, a senior researcher at INRIA, even before that INRIA ran. Uh, so, and today Patrick will talk about safer driving AI with limited human supervision. I'm very much looking forward uh, to his talk. Patrick, the stage is yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see if it works. Um, so, I'll talk about uh, mostly perception for uh, driving. And I will start with these videos, so there are plenty of them in the same screen. They are essentially some of our uh, uh, cars or well, platforms uh, traveling across long distances or in uh, urban uh, environments. You see also some of the uh, technical views. Uh, and what it takes for these cars uh, to, to, to do this is, uh, of course, uh, lots of AI, computer, uh, hardware, software, and good sensors. And you see actually them here. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few more words later on them, but essentially you have uh, laser scanners, also called LIDARs, cameras, uh, and radars in particular. Um, so, uh, as I said also yesterday at the panel, one of the reasons why we care about uh, assisted driving and, and autonomous driving is of course to, to, to make transport and mobility at large way better, safer, more efficient, etc. But when you think about it, in particular, in terms of for, for the people doing robotics, it's a bit of a crazy robotics uh, uh, problem because, of course, it, it embeds uh, 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 machine learning, uh, but uh, with the limited uh, 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 resources, it has to function in real time. It's a super safety critical. It uh, has to uh, operate in an extremely open and unpredictable world uh, with other uh, uh, agents, including uh, uh, vulnerable ones. And uh, a very specific thing as well is that a car is on the road for more than 10 years in average, so it's not a mobile phone. So we have to take this into account as well. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, challenges with these uh, uh, high level of automation, so-called uh, level three to five of uh, uh, driving automation, is that uh, there are many uh, different conditions where a vehicle can operate and uh, the uh, statistical distributions, they can even change uh, across time. Uh, so lots of different regions, different weather conditions, different driving situation, etc. And something you, you ideally don't want is a car, an, an autonomous car get, getting uh, a bit uh, perturbed by the sun glare, as you see on the left, or a heavy fog, or on the right, what you see is a real example of a, a fisheye camera of ours, which is at the bumper level, so it's extremely exposed. In this case, it's all soaked, and it, uh, of course, makes perceptions harder. So, in order to try and, and mitigate these problems, uh, we, we can do a number of things. Uh, the first one, and it's been, it's been a recurring theme uh, in the past uh, uh, today and yesterday, which is to have more uh, training data, whether real or synthetic, um, and uh, uh, with, from, from, from different, different sensors also. And in particular, one can try and make uh, as, um, as much as possible out of uh, unannotated data, what we call raw data, uh, including uh, by domain adaptation or supervised learning, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, or uh, you can try and, and uh, annotate uh, partially automatically this data. The top right example is actually from a collaboration with Tomas and other people at CTU with Pan Cloud annotation. Uh, but of course, it's very important to test these, uh, these systems uh, thoroughly on tracks, on roads. Uh, so you might uh, get a glimpse, a glimpse at, uh, at that uh, for those uh, visiting tomorrow, Valeo. And another aspect, which is, I think, very important, is the ability of the system to assess itself, its uh, confidence. I'll say a few words on that. And at the end of the day, we know a lot about the rules on, on the roads and the, and the rules of the, uh, of the physics. So uh, there is a lot of knowledge that we, we should try to, of course, incorporate in our systems. Uh, and what you see at the bottom left is uh, our, uh, one of our recording cars in, in, in Ireland. And at the bottom right, it's uh, uh, radar signals, which I will say a few more words about. Talking about sensors. Uh, so. Uh, 
it's really important to, to, to have multiple uh, types of sensors which are complementary. Here what you see is the, uh, the value of sensor suite. It's fairly classic in the, in the diversity. You have, uh, in particular, the, uh, the cameras, whether the, uh, the, 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 the fisheye cameras, which are around the car, or the uh, front cam, which is here. But you have also uh, LIDARs, uh, including these, uh, uh, these recent ones we have from near field. Uh, Scala is our own uh, product. Um, uh, what is important here is that this, these sensors here are uh, uh, already produced uh, at scale and deployed on, uh, on uh, personal cars. So these are actual products. And these are the ones you saw in the video uh, previously. Uh, so wh what is, what is uh, I want to highlight here is the complementarity of the different sensors. Uh, so the cameras and the laser scanners are pretty well known in the computer vision literature and, and community, and you see a lot of them in the, in the conferences. Maybe one which is uh, less popular or, or less uh, investigated at the moment, and we like it very much, is the radar. So you see here uh, uh, raw uh, signals from radar. It's essentially a spectrum of energy. And you have different views because you have three different axes, the distance of the object, the angle, the azimuth, it's called, of the object, but also the Doppler, which is essentially the relative speed of the object with respect to the sensor. In this case, the, sen the sensor is, is static. Uh, so it's not very easy to decipher this data, but it's something that we, uh, we, we, we are trying to do. And actually, two years ago, we proposed this uh, annotated data set where we actually segment precisely in these uh, weird representation uh, objects like a pedestrian, cyclist, and car. And, uh, and the way we did it uh, is using another modality. So it's yet another example of cross-modality uh, automatic an uh, annotation where we have an automatic object detector in the videos and we have off-the-shelf very powerful search detectors. And using these detections, then we, we transfer them automatically knowing the geometry into the uh, radar signal. Then we are able to track the objects in the radar signal and to segment them precisely. And you see some examples here where uh, these little things here are uh, annotated objects, okay? In the different views, in this case, it's, it's a, a range angle and Doppler, uh, and range Doppler. And once you have this data, then you can train an actual system uh, to segment objects in, uh, in the raw radar data, which, is, which we did uh, the year after. So what you see here is what, what we call the radar uh, cube. At a certain instant, you have a sequence of those. And uh, you can extract different views, uh, 2D views, uh, three of them from the cube, and then you can uh, uh, design and train a convolution neural network in order to uh, then decode or detect or segment uh, different classes of objects, and this is what you get here. And uh, of course, it's not very easy for, for our eyes to recognize here, but I can tell you that these are actual uh, pedestrian and, 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 and cyclist in the video. And this is just for the visualization. Everything is done only on the radar signal. All right, and, uh, and another thing about radar is that uh, nowadays we have new uh, uh, generations of radar, which are called which, with way many uh, uh, more antennas. And, uh, they are called uh, high resolution or imaging radar, and they can allow you to even get point clouds, etc. And we have released at CVPR uh, last uh, this summer uh, a data set uh, where we have uh, HD radar with camera and lidar and uh, with segmentation uh, and detection of, of, of um, vehicles and of uh, segmentation of the, what is called the free space. Uh, so if you're interested, you can just check it out. All right. Um, now I'd, I'd like to, to say a few words about uh, um, being efficient with the data, even if you have only partial annotation or no annotation at all. And again, it's very important. Collecting data at scale with cars, I mean, it's, it's not cheap, it's not easy, but you can do that to some extent. Uh, uh, but what is really annoying is to get the, uh, the annotation. All right. Uh, and uh, so imagine that you have lots of, of such raw data with multiple sensors, but you have a, a small budget for annotation. So what can you do about it? Uh, one, I'm not going to go through the list, but one key concept and key uh, uh, high-level tool in machine learning is, is to transfer things. Transfer from things that you know well to things that you know less well, so across modality, across sensors, as I just uh, mentioned earlier, across different domains of, uh, of operation, across different models, even sometimes across different tasks. So this is very powerful, and I'll say a few words on, uh, in particular on self-supervised learning and on uh, domain adaptation. Uh, but I want to highlight another 
sort of thread, which I'm not going to talk about today, is uh, to also generate new data uh, uh, annotated. So there is the classic way of simulating your environment. So we, people do that a lot in robotics. We discussed that earlier today. Uh, so a fully virtual environment with classic uh, simula simulation engine, for, and you know everything, so annotation is not a problem. But also there is there are all the generative uh, neural networks, which are also another way to by training to uh, um, generate new scenes, and it's very powerful. And now you have more and more of 3D aware such uh, models, which are which could be useful, uh, in particular for our applications in automotive. Um, uh, the the, uh, the so getting back to domain adaptation uh, that I want to highlight today. So domain adaptation uh, is the the setup where I mean the, the first the problem is how to is to try and and and, and reduce the gap between uh, some data uh, that you have at train time and data test and deploy time, which are quite different. So the terminology is that we have a source domain with uh, well-controlled, annotated data, clean data, uh, and a target domain for which you also have uh, data, but possibly without annotation at all, but you can use them at train time as well. And, and the, the two domains, they, they should have some structure in common, otherwise it's a bit of a waste of time. And the, the uh, very uh, classic example of this situation is when the, the source domain is synthetic simulation, and the target domain is real real data. And in this case, if you take these uh, classic tasks uh, tasks that we have in the perception of uh, for driving, which is semantic segmentation, which is recognizing objects at the pixel level, if you train on the synthetic data, then with a new synthetic view, you have a decent uh, uh, segmentation with your model, but it can be catastrophic as soon as you, are, you have a real scene. And of course, you don't want that in your car. So domain adaptation is how to do way better. Uh, and uh, in the uh, in the deep learning era, there is a, a very um, uh, powerful idea which actually was was first used for uh, classification, which is called adversarial domain adaptation, where the idea is to, that is to learn a model which. Uh, uh, builds on a, a representation of the input which is task uh, dependent but which is domain uh, independent. Uh, and a good way to align this representation between the two domains, the source and the target, is to use a discriminator with uh, in, in the context of adversarial uh, training. Um, and so uh, on this little graph here, you see that you have your main model, say seg uh, image segmentation, but it could be something else. You have some uh, annotated source data, and uh, you can train the usual way with, self super with uh, full supervision. But now you have as well uh, target data without any annotation, and you are going to select uh, some level of representation in your model. It could be at the input, or it could be close to the output, and you are going to train at the same time a discriminator, which tasks it to, is to decide whether the features of the representation comes from source or, or target. And hopefully at the end it would be confused, which means that your representation is domain agnostic. And then at, at deploy time, you just run your train model uh, on the target uh, domain data. And uh, uh, for semantic segmentation, uh, this thing with the same example, uh, uh, and with uh, you, you see that if you train your neural network, uh, is the example I showed, uh, on synthetic data, and then you run on uh, the synthetic scene, that's fine. On the real scene, it's not fine at all. And one interesting observation that you can make is that if you look at the uh, confusion at the pixel level of the classifier, so the entropy, uh, it could be something else, then uh, you see it's very confused on the uh, target uh, the target example, and this is actually something that we, we did leverage in a, in, a, in a work in, in 19, um, in an adversarial domain adaptation work, um, and uh, then using the, uh, the, the training example from target domain, we, we can then get way better uh, segmentation with way less uh, uh, confusion, way more confidence at the pixel level. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, just one example qualitative example here with uh, just one or two numbers. Uh, doesn't really matter for today, but you can see here uh, two, two scenes where you have before, uh, if you don't do any adaptation, and if you do adaptation the way we, we proposed it at, the t at that time, and at that time it was, uh, uh, it allowed us to, uh, uh, to push the set of the art by several so-called mean uh, in intersection of uh, over union points, which is the classic criteria for segmentic segmentation. All right, uh, and this idea of, um, of um, 
adversarial uh, unsupervised domain adaptation can be extended to, to multiple modalities. Uh, this example here, we the task is uh, semantic segmentation of point cloud, and we use the ideas to use both uh, images and LIDAR. Uh, and you can, the idea is that the domain gap between, say, synthetic and real, or between night and day, is not the same in the two modalities. Uh, for instance, the 3D structure is, uh, if you, the point cloud is fairly similar between night and day, uh, whereas the, the images are very different, etc. So we have a core, uh, a cross modality uh, learning here, that, which, which I'm not going to explain, but it's essentially an extension of what I, I, I presented before. And on this example here, you see that um, uh, in the day, uh, day to night adaptation, with this scheme here now, for some of the, uh, if you don't do adaptation in the, you might miss some of the objects that you recover here, and uh, vice versa, you can have uh, false positives, uh, which are wrong detection that you can uh, clean uh, with the adaptation. And you can Im easily imagine what is the benefit of this. Uh, Another uh, interesting aspect uh, when doing uh, unsupervised domain adaptation is that um, uh, you can do what is called self-training. It's, it's quite often is beneficial. The idea is that you have a first version of the model that you can then run on your unannotated target data, and this gives you automatic labels that you can you might want to reuse for the next uh, iteration. But uh, if you do that, you have to be careful to make sure that uh, there is, it's not too noisy. And uh, uh, it's important if, to be able to predict what is the confidence that you have in this first prediction on these uh, unannotated images. Uh, so again, on classification here, you can measure the confidence at the pixel level, and then uh, you retain only the, uh, the pixels for which you are fairly confident as new auto labels for retraining or fine tuning your model. And this, uh, this is very, very beneficial. Uh, but here there is an important con uh, concept, which is uh, uh, the confidence. So, um, the uh, or maybe I can show you here the, the, the benefit. It's very hard to s to see maybe on the screen here. But uh, typically, if you have a, a, a careful way to select what is confident or not, you see that here in green are the uh, the automatically labeled pixel that you retain for retraining. When they are green, they are. It's, it turns out that they are correct. If they are red, they are not, and they are fewer red uh, pixels on the right. Maybe it's not striking visually, but it does make a difference in the performance. Um, but the point here is the, how to assess the confidence. So there are classic ways, like I mentioned, the entropy, or you could look at the, the classification score uh, for, the, um, uh, for, the, uh, for a classifier, which is a classic way. Uh, i get in a minute uh, how to do better, but if you are able to, to have a, a um, a good assessment of, your, of the confidence of your main estimator, then you can use that for, for rejecting uh, 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 um, or for predicting that uh, a sample is out of distribution and you shouldn't take a decision. Or you can, uh, as I just showed, uh, do automatic annotation, which is useful. And at a system level, or more uh, even uh, uh, taking a robotics kind of uh, angle to things, if uh, one of your modules uh, uh, assess itself as being very uncertain, then you can pass this information either to the next module or to the next instant, or uh, you can rely on another uh, sensor, etc. So confidence estimation on the fly is very important. Uh, and one thing we proposed, uh, uh, because uh, the, the simple ways to assess performance or confidence are usually uh, not very good. And typically, new, deep neural networks are very confident even when they are wrong, and it's a well-known problem. There are other ways to, 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 to deal with that, with calibration, etc. But the one I want to uh, highlight today is to, uh, to learn another. So you have your, your main model here, which is uh, uh, trained and frozen. It, 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 it gives some prediction, say, for classification, one score per class. And uh, the idea is to train another model on top of the features of this model. And this uh, new model is an auxiliary uh, object. And uh, it, its task is to predict the, the, the confidence of the model for the given input. Uh, and one way to, 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 to supervise this training is to, at train time, you know the real class. So you know what is the score uh, for the real class. And you try to regress this with a classic uh, L2 loss. And it's very simple and very effective.
All right. Uh, I will finish by uh, a few words about uh, self-supervised learning. So, uh, uh, training with uh, no annotation at all has been discussed today, and uh, including by Cordelia and, and yesterday uh, uh, for language. Um, uh, it's 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 very interesting. In our case, uh, what we have is a lot of data which are synchronized with different sensors, as I already said. And the typical case is uh, cameras and lidars. And in these two recent works, uh, one presented uh, this. Summer at CVPR and, uh, and the other one of uh, Antonin, who is in the room here. So it's a collaboration with uh, CTU and Joseph. Um, it, it would be presented at ECCV. We, we rely on this alignment to, to do self supervised learning of uh, useful representation of the, uh, of the input. Uh, so I just will, I will say a few words, uh, or even no words, just images. Uh, on the uh, second one, uh, driven segments. So again, we uh, we have we assume that we have uh, uh, cameras and lidar points which are synchronized in times and in space. And without any annotation, we are able to learn a, a semantic segmentation model uh, uh, that you see here, which has never seen ever uh, a label. So it doesn't know in, uh, anything about semantics whatsoever. And you see the type of results. Of course, it's noisy, but again, bear in mind there is no annotator behind. Um, I'm not going to go through the, and I, then I will leave that for questions or for discussions if you want with Anthony as well. Um, is uh, uh, with the, uh, one example where you see that the model has been trained on a certain data set and now it's, it's used here to segment other images from another data set in particular with bad weather or, or night time. And you see this is on the right is a uh, column is ground truth, the middle one are the what you obtain. Uh, the colors, which are semantically meaningful, are matched, but the, again, our model doesn't know about semantics. All right, and uh, this brings me to the conclusion. Uh, one of the challenges we have already at the perception level for uh, assisted and autonomous driving is that we have to operate in a large, uh, uh, in, in all the domains or in many different domains. Uh, and uh, this is, and we like uh, data or annotated data. And some useful tools, of course, is not only to have a, a variety of sensors, but also various ways of uh, leveraging data with no annotation or, or little annotation, and also to make sure that we are able to predict the confidence of our model. Last point, which I mentioned already yesterday, is that uh, looking outside of the car is good, but looking at the driver is very important as well. Uh, in, in particular in the case of autonomous driving where you want to either take over from the driver or to disengage the system and this is also a very important topic and we really have no public data or, or little public data available so it's a, it's a call for the community and I will stop here. Thank you very much. Let's take Patrick. <laughs> for the very nice talk, are there any questions from the audience? Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for this excellent talk. I had one question. So you showed at some point the value sensor suite. And my question is, um, do you? <laughs> no, 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 not really. Um, well, actually, perhaps at one point. No, my question is, um, normally we have uh, sensor models for all these sensors. And do you still use them? And what is the role of sensor, uh, precise sensor models in all these uh, AI-related machine learning algorithms? Algorithm? OK, we, we, the models are very important for uh, testing and validation in simulation. I mean, they are important for, for when you design the sensors, of course. But we use them a lot uh, for the uh, validation. So part of the validation is done in simulation, and for that you obviously need uh, accurate enough uh, models for your sensors, if that was your question. But you don't use them as some kind of additional information in the model, right, to improve oh. things? No, but, well, not actually, not precisely. Of course, the, the, the type of setup, it's, I mean, in the case of fisheye cameras, which is a very specific uh, beast, uh, and there are not many uh, data sets uh, apart from the one actually we have released uh, two years ago, Woodscape. In that, I mean, in that case, I mean, taking into account the very specific geometry is very important and the calibration, etc. But beyond that, uh, we, we, the, specif the, the, the specifics are, of course, taken into account, like the radar, what is the wavelength, etc. But uh, not to the phys all the way to the physical model at this stage. Okay, thank you. One more question for Patrick. Thank you very much for fascinating presentation. My question would be, I believe a little bit uh, naive, uh, but uh, as a 
They are the most so difficult the, ones. An expert. You know, you can follow the development of the technology uh, via the media, for example. You know, this is the race for even higher uh, self-autonomy of the driver, of the car that drives itself, right? This is called, I believe, three to five level uh, levels of uh, the autonomous driving. My question is, uh, you know, sometimes you can read uh, in the newspapers, uh, very difficult to assess, obviously, you know, of uh, some uh, crashes or some, some uh, you know, failures of the technology. And th this is not uh, always clear whether it's already really about the technology about, or a driver's intervention. It might be a panic reaction or whatever. So in this uh, regard, I, I was quite, uh, uh, you know, um, it took my attention your uh, your uh, appeal to that we need to do more, uh, pay more attention to the driver himself or herself because it's an important actor. So is this possible the way that, that you can elevate the technology and build the confidence and the tra tra to, to build a trustworthy AI? That this is the holy grail. So, so, so it's a difficult question, and uh, just to, to make it short. So first of all, all the, uh, the current uh, accidents with uh, fully autonomous driving cars, which are authorized and which are all prototypes, which are authorized in the world, are reported to the authorities and they are examined. And uh, quite often, it's the it's the the fault of other cars, <laughs> so with human drivers. Uh, but it's 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 really documented. Um, of course, with fully driverless thing, uh, uh, the question is different. If you have no wheel, no pedals, then uh, it turns out that often you have a teleoperation behind. So you have, uh, in a sense, another driver. Um, what, what what is the? I mean, the accidents we had recently with actually commercial cars with high level of automation are mostly due, as far as we know, uh, due to an improper, improper use of the system by the human driver, using it as if it was a, a self-driving car and it's not. Maybe it was maybe uh, advertised this way, but it's not. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we have really to, to look into that and to make sure that uh, these uh, still unmature systems are, are well used. We'll see how it goes, and I, I think I, I said a few words as well yesterday in the panel about that. But uh, the the road is still uh, is still long. Yeah, let's thank Patrick again for a wonderful talk. <clears throat>